That's me. I'm a journalist. And there's one question I get asked all the time. How, how, did, how did you get into journalism? Journalism. Journalism. So what I say, how did you get into journalism? Yeah. Yep. How did I get into journalism? Well, I made this video to answer that question. You see, I grew up on the Redcliffe Peninsula, just north of Brisbane, on Australia's east coast. And as a kid, I used to tell people I wanted to be a pilot. Here's a photo of me at the school careers day dressed as one. Yep, swimming goggles, stonewashed denim jacket, mum's boots and all. Speaking of mum, she says there were early hints I was interested in journalism. When your daddy was a little boy, he used to take a notebook and a pencil to the local car park and take notes about who was parked in the car park and what was going on. He also had a favourite television show. Do you know what that was? It was Media Watch. And he used to get very upset if he didn't get to watch it each week. I remember proudly taking home a bronze medal at the state springboard diving competition and confidently walking into the local newspaper office and demanding to talk to a journalist. And I just happened to have my medal on me. During my high school years as a self-appointed class clown, study took a back seat to my real passion of rollerblading. Oh yeah mate, skate safe, fast and hard. You started filming yet? This passion for rollerblading saw me appear in a burger chain commercial and led to me connecting with the community group that also got my face in the local paper plenty of times. This is my geography teacher's assessment of me at that time. David has displayed some knowledge and comprehension of concepts, but without detail. He makes unjustified decisions with little attention to the conventions of expression. Ouch. But that same distraction that was skating got me into the editing suites that at the time only the rich could afford. Psst! I actually don't know what I'm doing. I'm just hamming it up for the cameras. So I finished high school in 1995 with really bad marks. But I somehow managed to get into a business course that allowed me to get a diploma after just two years. I wasn't particularly interested in studying business, but I thought it was about time that I applied myself to some form of study and I didn't have any other ideas. I got a job at McDonald's and by the end of 1996 I'd saved up enough money to buy a ticket to Japan for a working holiday. I was 19 and overseas for the first time. Life was exciting. I carried my point and shoot camera around with me every day and I sent photos and detailed letters back to my family and friends in Australia. Just before I left for Japan I'd applied for a position on Race Around the World. It was a 1997 television experiment in which young people were given video cameras, training and round the world tickets with multiple stops over 100 days. Needless to say, I wasn't one of the chosen eight and unfortunately I didn't even think to make a backup copy of the written or video applications that I'd sent in. I came back to Australia, finished my diploma and I used that to get into university and continued studying business because I still had no idea what I wanted to do. When I wasn't working as a clown and children's entertainer, I was creating a lot of multimedia content. My brother and I produced the Ictum inline zine, and we produced do-it-yourself videos such as Pecking Like a Chicken. Shanice? Hmm. Where were I know you from? Oh, it's so annoyed. Yeah, I was a little bit pissed. I appeared in student films. And I made a cameo in my sister's high school project and cult classic, Scab or Saint. I started writing letters to the local newspaper about issues such as the Sun Girls logo. Not too mature. The Redcliffe Sun Girls logo identifies what they obviously want us to take to be the essence of a female residing on the peninsula. That particular letter ruffled a few feathers. Girl praise. David Stewart suggests the Sun Girl logo fails adequately to represent the essence of a female residing on the peninsula. Of course it does. But I also had some support. Torpedo the torso. I, like David Stewart, have reservations about the appropriateness of this logo. And then a surprising result. New Sun Girls logo. The controversial swimsuit torso on our logo is being replaced. But of course it wasn't for any of the reasons I pointed out, no. Rather, 
The redesign is due to the Redcliffe Sun Curl concept evolving so dramatically. There you go. By this stage, I'd already turned around my attitude towards study, and I'd somehow managed to get a scholarship to study in Texas for a semester. The scholarship required that I wrote a report at the end of my stay, and I took great pleasure in pumping out 10,000 words that detailed everything from living on a dollar a day and my exchanges with the slumlord who collected my rent each week, to a shoestring road trip to New York. I graduated from university with a business degree, and developed a 10-year plan. Yep. I even made a fly for this plan that would see me work in private enterprise, unions and the government, and end in 2011 with me embarking on my dream career. In 2001 I kicked off this plan when I worked for Australia's foreign aid program creating human resource management paperwork in Vanuatu. The work itself was not very exciting, but living in a little bamboo hut and having daily jungle adventures certainly was. Of course, my time in Vanuatu would not have been complete without being involved in a passionate film production when my brother and a friend came to visit me. After completing that contract, I returned to Australia in 2002 and bought an expensive but at times defective second-hand laptop at a government auction. I wrote a 33,000-word essay on my experiences in Vanuatu and taught myself how to make basic websites so I could showcase my essays and the experiences around my 10-year plan. After buying my first digital camera, I teamed up with Todd and Trev, two friends from high school, to create Core 3, a site that could very generously be described as an early and low budget version of BuzzFeed. The plan now was to move to Tokyo, but first I had to earn some money so I could afford to buy a ticket. Despite my business degree, I did this by returning to one of my part-time university jobs in a catering kitchen. I wrote more letters to the local paper. And I started writing letters to larger media players, demanding they tell me how they decide what constitutes the news every day. Despite this clear pattern emerging, I still had no idea that I wanted to be a journalist. I created a personal homepage, and I finally moved to Japan's capital, where I worked as an English teacher. I came alive in Tokyo. There was so much happening. It was like a giant playground. There was so much to point my camera at. I was getting a real wage for the first time in my life and soon purchased a brand new laptop. I'd send audio recordings that outlined my experiences back to my friends. So every night I try to get 400 yen in my hand, which is about six bucks almost, and I go down to the local bathing house. During holidays I'd write comprehensive pieces on my journeys. My brother and I began working on a children's book that was never published. I started reaching out to friends asking them to contribute travel essays for my sites. Every night after work I'd rush home to start working on my latest blog post. And then one day in 2004 it finally struck me. My hobby was journalism. I could make my passion my career. And this coincided with another major decision in my life. I resigned from my job with this letter. I recently successfully proposed to the woman I love and we plan to move to Osaka where I will pursue a career in journalism. So we jumped on the bus, got married, and I soon found a new job as an English teacher. You've got to pay the bills. I bought my first digital video camera and I started to film everything I encountered and me just being silly. I would edit them into 30 minute videos and make my own DVDs. I sent these off to everybody I knew, complete with liner notes. In Nishinari, I spoke to bicycle thieves, preachers, transvestites, vendors of pornography, street kids, and more. Available in print or on the internet. Welcome to Big Camo 4 for a magical week in Thailand. I wasn't in a position to study journalism full time, so I went online and looked at the reading list for a journalism degree and purchased all of the books on Amazon. I read them all cover to cover. I connected with real journalists online. I started to analyze journalistic content rather than just consume it. The guy who had filmed us skating in the 90s had worked his way up to become a news cameraman and he took me under his wing. One day my father pointed something out to me. He said while my DVDs were funny, it would be nice if I could make a serious video on someone like the guy who was teaching me bamboo craft when I was living in Tokyo. He had a point. So I jumped on a Tokyo bound bullet train with my tiny camcorder and a consumer grade tripod and spent a few days in his workshop shooting him going about his business. The subsequent 30 minute video was my first serious attempt at journalism. This splitting is something that he's been doing since he was a young boy. And with so many years of experience, it comes as second nature to him. 
Back in Osaka, I encountered a guy in the electronics district who pushed around a wagon that was full of copies of his self-published books about a philosophy that he developed. So, Kaneki Yoshio agreed to be the subject of my second documentary. And a Romanian Scrabble fan was next on the list. So I'd reached out to journalists, I'd read the textbooks, I'd devoured podcasts on my chunky mp3 player, I'd embraced Twitter, I'd had my documentaries shown at events around the world. But I was still working as an English teacher and I knew that I needed to take some solid action if I actually wanted to be a journalist. So after discussing the matter with my wife, we moved back to Australia in late 2008 so I could get my foot in the industry. I hit the ground running. But what do you think about that? I think that's a bit dodgy. I'm not a complete ban. It'd probably be a good thing. I walked into the public gallery of courts. In fact, I actually spent an entire month in the Brisbane courts watching criminal trials play out. It was fascinating. I applied to every advertise opening for journalism and media jobs. The Great Barrier Reef? That must be an omen! To my computer! But it was rejection after rejection. Back in 2009, the Australian Story offices were housed in this building behind me. Now, I wanted to get inside and sell myself to them, but a security door prevented me from getting inside. So I did what any uh, human being keen to break into the journalism industry would do. Yes, I snuck in behind someone else and went to the Australian Story offices and gave my spiel, ultimately to no avail. I started helping out at a Japanese language radio program on 4EB. That's Brisbane's multilingual radio station. I volunteered as a camera operator at Brisbane's community television station. Ironically, my wife very soon found work writing for a Japanese street press magazine that sent her around Australia. My photography and I often appeared in the magazine. People assumed I was humiliated, but I wasn't. I knew where I was going, even if it was taking a while. After years of continuous use, my video camera started to play up. It was time to invest a few thousand dollars in some serious video gear. Again, I started to shoot everything and anything that happened in my vicinity. What's it for anyway? 2009! When are you going to start paying rent? When are you going to afford it? <laughs> Chicken dinner. What are you here for? Through the legislation, we actually found that there's a loophole. <laughs> That's the thing, right? You come over here, they speak very good Australian. I like it. After a mountain of rejections and seeing my savings erode, it was again clear that something needed to be done. So that's how, with my wife's full support, in 2010, I ended up at J School, enrolled in a highly practical one-year course that I chose over a similarly priced master's degree. And I was in my element. I made new friends. I went to council meetings, court trials, events, learned how to write shorthand, gate-crashed media events. It was a hiding place to get away from the cities and the government and everything else. I did four separate internships where my work was published in print or broadcast. This report was compiled by David Stewart. I'd built up a portfolio of work on Newsbytes, J School's online newspaper. I didn't expect to have any troubles finding work once I'd received my diploma, but that was not the case. Again, I applied for every journalism job I came across and kept myself busy creating more content. Most of our puppets are made with a wire armature, like aluminium wire. And we employ uh, people with disabilities in their intellectual learning and we give them work. I was shortlisted for a few interviews. I even did a two-day work placement for a regional daily newspaper. But again, the rejections started piling up. One particular letter from an editor seemed to sum up my specific challenge. You were one of the outstanding candidates, but your skills and experience mark you out as being well above the basic requirements of a trainee. And I have long been of the view that it is a disservice to individuals with your track record to hire them as trainees. I suspect all of that is cold comfort. Yes, it was. I decided to branch out a little. In 2010, I had tried stand-up comedy and I decided to explore online humour in the hope that I might be discovered. I created a Japanese alter ego named Suzuki Debinosuke and made a series of YouTube videos that I quietly uploaded without promoting. And I sent in other content to a popular British radio show. And several people have written in poems of an epic nature. 
almost Beowulf this. This is from David Stewart, and he's going to be the prize winner this week. And his poem goes as follows. Chilled ex-hippies, mum and dad had rules significantly fewer than that of the notorious tiger mother, Dr Amy Chua. And I continued to work on the Japanese language radio program. The J-School director saw me struggling to find work and asked me if I'd like to work for him as a tutor and video producer while I applied for jobs. I was honoured to be asked to join the team. I took students out on the streets of Brisbane and gave them experience in front of a camera. We're here in the Brisbane CBD to see who will become the next Premier. One day I took some students to a Brisbane City Council meeting. They sat in the public gallery while I shot from inside. Because of early evening deadlines, the other camera operators had packed up and left when a councillor dug in her heels and refused to follow a suspension order. This is a joke! You cannot keep doing this! And you're sitting here watching it. You cannot keep doing it! The police were called in. And I had exclusive vision that several outlets used without payment. Brisbane City Council meeting got out of hand overnight. One councillor had to be marched out by police. It's I thought that may have been my lucky break, emptiness. but it wasn't. So I continued with my applications. I'm David Douglas Stewart. And I'm applying for the ABC Open producer position in Rockhampton. But the rejections kept coming. In late May 2011, more than six months after graduation, and about seven years after deciding I wanted to be a journalist, I finally got my foot in the door when the Tweed Daily News decided that I was the ideal applicant. And that's how I got into journalism. Absolutely. Round of applause for David Stewart there. We weren't expecting anything as epic or as poetic as that, but a truly lovely story. It's only come on since writing the songs for Eurythmics, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs>